Good morning. It's a beautiful day to be out and about. And then um, I don't know exactly what we're going to do. I'm, I'm going to take a little break, and I don't know if uh, Pastor Harvey and Dave are filling in or just what we're doing for Sunday school, but we'll figure something out. Um, but we've got four weeks to go, including today, so really three weeks from now would be the last one. So we've been um, looking at this book with, by Matt Thomas, and, and again, it's just talking about how to win the lost, right? and having a burden for the lost. We, uh, we started with the part one, which was, oops, the why of go. Why do we do this, right? I mean, Jesus said, go and make disciples. We know that, and, and uh, I, I enjoyed uh, uh, Brother West sharing about this very same topic. I think it was on Tuesday night, talking about the idea of of going and making disciples, but all that, but that's not the only thing we got to do, right? We, we have to share our story, and that's the second part, is the how of go. And it's, right, we've just spent several weeks, or actually a couple of months, talking about how to reach those that are lost, and, you know, things like, you just use the material that God's given you, right? Your story, and and having a concern and asking the Holy Spirit to guide you and direct you and, and give you the right words, right? Uh, and introducing those to Jesus. It's not just about living the life, it's about making an introduction. And so we talked about all that. And so this next uh, four sessions is, is the who will go. Who should I be talking to, right? Um, who needs to hear the good news from us? <laughs> I mean, the simple answer is everyone, but the, the, what, what we need to do is, what we want to do is just kind of step back and say, okay, let's look at this a little deeper, right? And, and, and look at the different groups of who we should be sharing the good news with. Um, you know, one of the questions we can ask ourselves is, with whom can we share it most effectively, right? And we've talked a little bit about that. Our story, the story that God has given us, is in part one of the tools that he has given to reach specific individuals, right? Because God is in charge. He knows everybody better than we know ourselves. And he knows which of our stories connects better with those around us. And so the Holy Spirit does makes these little divine appointments for us, right? And so these are some of the things... The, the, you know, who can I share with most effectively? Well, the most effective way you can, or person you can share is, is the one the Holy Spirit has put in your path. That's one of the items that we're going to talk about, but not today. <laughs> um, what is our aim? Well, we want to hit the bullseye, don't we? And the bullseye is making an introduction to Jesus. And, and so the, the main thing is, is that others will join us as we worship a holy and marvelous Lord and Savior, right? Amen. A Father who is perfect, right? And, and who loves us with a perfect love. And those are the kinds of things that we want to help others join us in this, this great walk of 
living with Christ. So there's a verse in, chap in Acts chapter 1 that we all know, we've all heard it, and, and it's part of this great commission idea, and it's Acts 1 verse 8. It says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, right? Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he's telling them to tarry, and then they're going to see something on the day of Pentecost, right? And he says, and you then shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, right? In all Judea and Samaria, three different spe specific locations, and then he says, and to the end of the earth. So that's, uh, Sister Naomi said, everyone. Yeah. That's the ends of the earth, right? And part of that is, is our commitment to missions, right? Not all of us can go to the ends of the earth, can we? But we can go to the ends of the earth with our, our money, right? So being a witness is more than just sharing Jesus, right? It's sharing the resources that God has given us. And, and that's an important piece of it because if, you know, we're winning souls left and right, yay, right? But if we are frugal when it comes to supporting missions, we're not doing all of the will of God, are we? And so it's so important that we remember our monthly commitment, right? Because if we don't, then there's those that are abroad that are not going to have the resources they need, right? And so, but the bottom line is that there's these four kind of distinct different places. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, bullseyes. And I'm calling this one a circle of power. Because what did Jesus say? He says, right, you will receive power. You receive influence, right? And you will be witnesses of me. What was the key piece of that? The Holy Spirit, right? That's, that's where the power comes from. And, and so uh, within that is, in what Jesus talked about, there was these four different distinct places. The first one is Jerusalem. Now again, Jesus was talking about, the context was talking to the disciples, right? Who were ministering in Jerusalem, right? So in our context, what is our Jerusalem, right? It's here, it's Spokane, Washington, or Colbert, Washington, or Nine Mile Falls, Washington, right? Spokane Valley. That is our Jerusalem. And interestingly, you can break it down further, and that's what Pastor Matt does, and we'll go, get into that a little bit, because your Jerusalem, when you're talking about, is your close circle of friends as well. And that's what we mostly want to talk about, is those closest to us, right? And so, there's, uh, Matt Henry says, Matthew Henry says this, he says, no. Is that right? Christ's witnesses shall receive power for that work to which he calls them, right? And so when we step out, what is our first thought? Jesus, I'm not stepping out unless it's with your power, right? Because if we try to do it in ourselves, it devolves into something that is ungodly, like the Baptist church that, that is always spewing hatred towards abortion clinics, right? That is not the way that Jesus taught his disciples, is it? We are to love our neighbor as ourselves, not throw hatred their direction, right? And they would say it's for a greater cause, but Jesus never did it that way, did he? And neither should we. And so he says, shall receive power for that work to which he calls them. He goes, he goes on, those whom he employs in his service, he will qualify. Raise your hand if you're qualified. When you gave your life to Christ, you immediately became qualified. Why? It's not what you know, it's what he knows, right? And he knows everything in ad infinitum, right? And that's the resource we need to tap into. 
So those whom he employs in the service, he will qualify for it. And he will bear them out in it, right? And sometimes it's hard. I know uh, Sister Charlene, she has had a struggle with those closest to her. They are continuously putting her down for her faith. But it is a good fight. And that's what we need to remember. Because Jesus will bear us out in it. If we just remain faithful. He goes on. That their influence should be great. And very extensive. That's what we want to have. Is influence amongst our closest friends. Don't we? He goes on. You shall be witnesses for witnesses for Christ and shall carry his cause. And we know we need to do that, don't we? That's what we've been talking about. So the first area that Jesus says is we need to be his witnesses in Jerusalem. Matthew Henry says, there you must begin. Right? If we can't share Jesus amongst our closest circle, those around us, our neighbors, those that we work with, there's a problem, isn't there? He goes, there you must begin, and many there will receive your testimony. And those that do not, do not, will be left inexcusable. That's the difference, isn't it? They have no excuse. And it starts at home, doesn't it? And it's those that we rub elbows with on it. This is our community. This is our Jerusalem. So then he goes on, Judea. Right? Now Judea was the area around Jerusalem. So you could say that is the state of Washington. And doesn't the state of Washington need the good news? You know, the one thing about what's happened in the Supreme Court it, is it will divide those that support abortion in this state which is a huge plurality, and those of us who do not. We are, going, we are on the front lines right now. If you live in Idaho, and you're pro-life, you are amongst friends. In the state of Washington, you are not. And Planned Parenthood is in the middle of all of this. That is our Judea. Matthew Henry says, Your light shall thence shine throughout all Judea, where before you have labored in vain. Lord, let it be so. Amen? And you know what's interesting about that is, is that, you know how if you're in a dark room, it only takes a teeny little light to change the circumstances of that room, right? And yet it's a big area. And that is our state. And that's what we need to do is carry the good news to those that live in our state. And then there's Samaria. Samaria was the region, right, of Judea and Jerusalem. And in many ways, you could say that our Samaria is the United States, right? And so, thence he says, you shall proceed to Samaria. Though at your first mission, you were forbidden to preach in any of the cities of the Samaritans. It is your nation. And it is a, it, it, it is a nation of Samaritans now, isn't it? Didn't used to be that way. But it is now. And we need to love them. Right? We need to do all the things that we talked about in the how of go. We need to listen with love, don't we? And we need to remember that it starts in our Jerusalem. It expands to our Judea and our Samaria, right? But Jesus didn't end there, did he? He said, and to the ends of the earth. Your usefulness shall reach to the uttermost part of the earth, right? And you shall be blessings to the whole world. You know, I'm just thinking about uh, this little community in Chumo, Tanzania. It, no electricity. It is, um, I think it's like 30 miles from the nearest big city. 
but it's all back roads, so it takes over an hour to get there. And it takes, and if it's monsoon season, it takes a four-wheel drive. And we have been supporting ourselves. Um, some friends of ours, daughter and uh, well, both two sets of friends of ours, their daughter and their son are married, and they have been ministering in Chumo, Tanzania for I don't know, it must be about it's approaching ten years now, reaching. Tanzanians, and this is the southern part, it's not the real beautiful part of the country, which is up on the north side where all the beautiful mountains are. But we have a stake in that. And the work that they are doing. Amen? And it's just like our church body. We support many missionaries. Down in Panama, uh, the um, the Boyds, yeah. <laughs> And, and they are part, they've been down there now for uh, going on, I want to say 30 years almost. And they have been, uh, they are now leading what's called Child Hope, which is the Assemblies of God ministry that, that gives kids schooling. And then they feed them. And, and we've been a part of that as a church body, and we have supported actually, it was uh, Sherry's a brother who was in just before they went came and visited in Coeur d'Alene and they um, he was in uh, uh, Costa Rica and so we've always supported a child in Costa Rica for all these years with an education that's going to the other most parts of the world some of us might be able to go on missions trips right and so that's the ends of the earth. But I just want to go back to Acts 1, verse 8, the first part, because again, you shall receive. Amen? You shall receive. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so what ought we to be doing, right? We should be spending time Asking the Holy Spirit to give us words, to give us those that, the, that, to give us the boldness to go in and, and make what he has put those divine appointments and be obedient to that, right? We need to be able to listen to that still small voice. We need to wait on his presence, don't we? So that we, it's front of mind all the time. It's like pastor says, I'm, it's what I do, right? And that's part of what's been missing. And I'm not just talking to you, I'm talking to myself. We need to get in the business of winning souls for Christ. Because it's a lost world. It's a lost world. So the schedule for the next four Sundays is this, today we're talking about the who of those closest to us. Next week, those in greatest need. And on the 10th of July, those whom God has placed in my path, right? And then we'll finish up with those who are part of my story. So, similar to the rings of influence, those, those Jerusalems, Judeas, and Samarias, we have our own personal circle of friends, right? And so the idea is, you know, this is a, a diagram and you may not be able to see it, but the idea is that, that you have a, a small circle of very close friends, a larger circle of friends that you call friends, but they're not, you know, intimate friends. And then you have a bigger one of acquaintances, that you might know them and they know you. Um, it's funny, Pastor, we were having breakfast yesterday morning and Jonathan Bingle was in the booth next door. And I, I know he recognized me, but he didn't. And I just said, how are you doing? And he's like, uh, fine. He's like, <laughs> he, he would be, I would call an acquaintance at this point. But though, you know, so, and, and the bigger, the farther away, the, the greater the number, right? Not many of us, and, and you know what, one of the sad truths I think is in the very closest one, the very intimate ones, it, this, this chart tells you how, on average how many people are in that circle. 
And in this one, in the very center of you, it says 1.5. And that's sad in many ways. Most uh, specialists will say you should, you know, have around five. That's about all we're capable of having. In, 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 and these are intimate people who you would share anything with them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Matt Thomas says, I'm sure there are people who you know well, and they know you well. When it comes to talking about the deepest experiences of your life, there are a, there are a class of friends and family members that make up your inner circle. I would say your Jerusalem. The important matters of your life are shared with them, right? He says, when I first discovered God's love for me and experienced his forgiveness of me and my sins, I couldn't wait to tell some of my closest friends and family members about the change that had occurred in my life. And what I want to say this morning is part, a lot of these um, stories that Matt has shared, Pastor Dan has shared similar stories. And what I'm, one of the connections I want to make is that it's not just Pastor Dan's story, it's it's a universal truth, right? So there's New Testament examples. We look at Mark chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. We see Jairus, right? What was he doing? He was bringing Jesus to his daughter, right? He was an official in the synagogue. There was great risk in doing what he was doing because the other fellow officials kind of looked down on that sort of thing. But he had heard about the power of Jesus. And he said to himself, if I just introduce him to my daughter, she will be well. That's what we're talking about. And though she was sick of disease, we have loved ones that are sick of the disease of sin, right? And that's the principle we're looking at. We see in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, the four friends of the paralyzed man. What did they do? They heard about the power of Jesus. And though they couldn't get him through the door, what did they do? <laughs> they destroyed somebody's roof to let him down. They had to work at it, didn't they? So that they might introduce him to Jesus. Matt Thomas says in both cases, we don't get the sense that either the daughter of the, or the paralyzed man expressed a desire to receive the good news. No, it was the family and friends who did whatever it took to show them the power of Jesus. That's what we want to do. That's what we need to do, don't we? And so the first circle is those closest to us that we want to talk about reaching. And, and you know, one of the things that as I've been thinking about, at least in our life, are those are in our circle are saved, almost all of them. And there's something wrong with that. Right? If we are not welcoming outsiders into our circle, they can't experience the power that we live in. And so what we have got to do is work at increasing that circle. If not, you know, again, it can't be a huge number of people because you don't have that closeness. But we need to work at bringing those outside. Now, some of us do have those that are close and they are not believers, right? And so great, you have a mission field right there. But some of us need to work at it and get that circle maybe broadened a little bit. So Matt Thomas says, many of us have good friends and caring family. We know them well and care deeply for them. They know us and will likely be interested in what we have experienced and what we have to say about it. Now again, like Sister Charlene, that's not been what she's experienced. Instead, they've ridiculed her. We need to talk 
about that a little bit more, and there is a little bit more to talk about there. He says, with them, we should be the most ready and willing to share our testimony as reliable witnesses of the good news. So the farthest removed one in our circle here is acquaintances. And outside of that, at least in this circle, are, you know, people that we know for just because we recognize them, we've seen them on TV, maybe they're a celebrity, you know, all these kinds of things, right? But inside of that circle is acquaintances, people that we recognize because we've met them or, or something, right? And this can be a large amount of people. They say that we, and, and the number here is, is uh, I believe, 1,500. If your memory is that good, <laughs> and you're in a lot of different social circles, you might have up to 1,500 acquaintances. That's a pretty deep pool, isn't it? And he says, um, so the furthest removed are acquaintances. Most people likely, he's, and he says hundreds of those, right? We have at least hundreds of those. We know the name and basic information about our acquaintances so that we can carry on a decent conversation. We can log away the basic information for, he says, roughly 1,000 people, depending on our memory banks and breadth of our social circles. So that's the first one. The next closest circle to us, he entitles distant friends. He says, these are folks we know quite well and have spent periods of time together. We know more than the basic information. He says, our lives have intersected enough that we know quirks, personality traits, preferences, and even some knowledge of their history. That's a pretty big circle of friends. Probably a hundred, maybe, for some of us. And then there's our close friends. And as you know, as you can see, the circles are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, aren't they? Because, again, what... what uh, psychiatrists and sociologists know is that you can only sort of have a certain number of people that you can actually be close to. So the next circle represents our close friends. Close friends are those we know quite well, right? We would take vacations with them and we will likely stay in regular contact. We have much in common and look for opportunities to spend time with them. And then, of course, there's the small circle. And this he calls intimate friends. Our spouse should be there, right? <laughs> if our spouse isn't in that circle, we got problems. <laughs> and there are many marriages that that's true, isn't it? Yeah. Our, our best friends, right? Parents sometimes. Family members may fall into this circle. Experts suggest that we only have emotional, spiritual, mental, and relational capital for one to three of these relationships. So don't fret, right? But one of the things, again, is, is again, Lord, if my circle of friends, close friends, is really small, help me to expand them. And don't let it be just believers, right? Let's reach out, let's branch out and bring those in that they may see our life so that we can be a light that they can see. He says, according to the Guardian News Source, about one person in 10 says he or she has no close friends. 10%. He says, and 19% report that they have not felt loved by others in more than two weeks. Isn't that sad? One in five people. He says, according to a Gallup research poll, though, 55% of people report five or fewer close friends. But the good news is, is that more than 80% of people who report perceiving love and having good relationships. And that's where we want to be, is in that 80%. So if we're in the 20, Holy Spirit help us, right? Help us to expand that. And, and not, not just, you know, well, nobody's telling me how much they love me. You be the person that tells somebody how much you love them, right? Let's, let's be 
the person that's doing it, not receiving it, right? And that's a great starting group for living and telling the good news, isn't it? So what do we say to those close to us? Right? This is where the rubber meets the road. Because it's hard. I mean, everybody knows Pastor Dan's story with his father. And it turns out Matt Thomas had a similar story. But the, the, one of the important things we should do is reinforce our love for them. Oops, sorry. And their values in our life. Oops, that's right. This is the first point. <laughs> reinforce our love for them, right? I love you. I don't agree with you, maybe, but I love you, right? And so, I love the statement that he makes here. Relationship is not about leverage, but respect. Right? He says, the closer we are, the more we must express our love and respect for our family and friends. It is not our superior knowledge of eternal things that draws our close relationships, right? It is a life lived in love and redemptive words spoken in love. And I'm thinking of my friend, our friend Jim Freeman. Uh, they live in Rathdrum. His family is a bit of a train wreck. And it is hard for him. They live up in Sandpoint. And every time they go, he, he's got to prepare himself. Because it's so easy to get caught up in blah, right? Instead of being redemptive and responding in love. First, um, First Corinthians 8, first part of it, verse 1 says, knowledge puffs up. But what does love do? And it always does, right? It must edify. So, reinforce our love for them and their value in our lives. Secondly, don't present ourselves as people who have completed the journey, right? <laughs> it's, no, it's like the, you know, uh, parents, have, every one of us has been a parent, has had some young person come up and say, why aren't you doing this? Right? And you're like going, are you a parent? <laughs> it's the same principle, isn't it? We haven't arrived, but um, so uh, don't present ourselves as people who have completed the journey. Instead, we convey that we are recipients of grace, right? There before the grace of God go I. Matt Thomas, it says, as famous people often reflect upon how their family and close friends are not impressed with their stardom or fame, right? They're just so-and-so. I grew up with him, and he has a lot of flaws, and I know every one of them, right? And we are no different, right? He says, I remember my reluctance in sharing the good news with my father. I thought, why would he want to listen to me? I am the one who argued with my siblings, broke the shop window and failed to confess it, and broke curfew on more than one occasion. He says, in reality, this conversation is just the one to have. Just think about that for a moment. This is the time to confess. Seek forgiveness. Acknowledge what, the, that, what, what each other already knows as part of the conversation about change, right? Those who know our weaknesses are more likely to be interested in hearing about our change. And how better to do that than say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Right? So, this one, don't present ourselves as people who have completed our journey, right? But we are recipients of grace. Thirdly, let our intimate circle know about how we have changed and are changing. It's supposed to be changed. Right? Oh, I used to be like that. You know, sometimes uh, when I'm in mixed circles, it was just uh, the other day I was in this golf thing and, you know, everybody's drinking. They didn't ask me. 
And the thing is, is that could have been, I, I could have used that as an opportunity. Well, here's the reason why, right? Those are, those again, are, are the opportunities that sometimes um, I, I am guilty of missing. But you are involved in change if you are walking with Jesus, aren't you? From glory to glory, he's changing me, right? Matt Thomas says we communicate that they, uh, that they mean so much to us and we can't help but share the new, right? Added meaning in our lives. And we talked a little bit about that a few weeks ago. If there's not new stuff going on in your journey, time to go to the altar. We all need to be having the fresh anointing pouring through us. The Holy Spirit cannot be held into us because it will just be like manna bread. It will go sour. We are supposed to be conduits of His love. Pouring out, bubbling out, spilling over, right? So it needs to be fresh every morning. So he says, uh, uh, we tell the story of Jesus, right? We tell how our story has been impacted by him. And we tell how God wants to impact their story as well. Because we want to make an introduction, don't we? Fourthly, we should give them an opportunity to join us. Again, we need to make the introduction, don't we? So often we forget to do that. Because we think it's obvious, maybe. I don't know. But we need to remember to make that introduction. Give them an opportunity to join us on the journey. Pray with them. Ask them if you can pray with them. And a lot of the times they may say no. But there's the one day like Pastor Dan was saying about his, your uncle, right? There comes a day when they have so much introspection and they are looking back and the Holy Spirit, there's an intersection in their life and they say yes. And we don't know when that is. And so we should never give up, right? We need to keep on and keep on the dialogue. We have to give them the opportunity. He says, answer questions, but do so with humility and with honest limitation. Where limitation exists. Don't try to oversell it. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Right? Be patient. Just as God has been patient with you. Right? We continue the dialogue as long as necessary. And then the last one is. We should inform our closest friends and family. That our relationship with them is for the long haul. Regardless. See, I, I uh, skipped. I wanted to read this story because, again, I, I like the parallel uh, to Pastor Dan's own story with his dad. It's different, but similar. He goes, The reality is often that people are most reluctant to share religious, political, or other controversial or personal views with their, those closest to them for fear that it might jeopardize their relationship. Right? People worry they will push their family or friends away if they espouse something contrary to their values. Though this makes emotional sense, it, it, it does not make relational sense. He says, that which is deeply personal and valuable to us should matter to those closest to us, right? He says, if we are subjected to ridicule or judgment from our closest circle, the relationship we hope to preserve wasn't close to begin with. Or it needs an honest and transparent litmus test to see whether it is worth maintaining. He says, in my case, I had a strained relationship with my father when I came, became a follower of Jesus. He eventually came to faith in Christ and is now passed and is no longer with us. But at the time, he was verbally and adamantly opposed to religion in general and Christianity Specifically, I was faced with a choice. Let my father know the good news while risking his ire and chiding, or remain silent and preserve a strained relationship, masking the most important matters in my life while preserving a surface peace undisturbed by religious information. He says, I chose the former, and I'm glad I did. 
Though taking the softer and less troubling road would have been much easier, it would force me to betray the unrestrainable joy and change in my life. Further, it would hold me accountable to God for my failure to represent Him honestly and with the hope of full restoration and reconciliation of my Father with God and with me. He said, I would love to report that my Father was pleased and expressed joy, right? But the opposite occurred at first. He let me know that I was wasting my life with fantasy. However, I can joyfully report that throughout the following 30 years, 30 years, he came to trust me, confide in me, and ask me for help with his struggle with addiction and even live in our own home. He expressed his gratitude for our loving life, good parenting, and valuable ministry. And it says he eventually surrendered his life to Jesus Christ and subsequently referred to me joyfully as his pastor rather than his son. He says a title I gladly accept. He says, I write this because I understand the dilemma some seem to face. He says, however, the cost is high for those we love if we do not talk to them, right? We are in a battle for our loved ones. And we need to keep that in our, the back of our mind that we are trying to take them to heaven with us for eternity, right? That they wouldn't spend eternity Amen. in hell. Right? Amen. It's worth it then. Amen. It's worth it to take their chiding and their disapproval. Yeah. It's like a badge of courage. It should be, right? Yeah. For all of us. So he says, it is certainly our responsibility to love and communicate meaningfully and truthfully with those we love and the family and friends closest to us. Right? And so that's what we're, we're at this morning, is, is doing just that. And again, for those of us who, everybody in our circle saved, open the circle a little wider. Right? For some of us, that's the case. For others of us, let's double down. Let's do what Sister D did. Holy Spirit, how can I talk to my son or my father or my, right? Show me the way because what did he say? You shall have power. Right? And that's what we need to get a hold of. Um, So he's, Matt Thomas says, it's worth mentioning that intimacy promises to be much deeper if our values and priorities are aligned, right? What he's saying is, is if, if we are on the same page in our family, then the intimacy goes even deeper, doesn't it? That's not a matter of manipulation, he says, to get people to believe. It is a statement of fact, right? If Christ is our all in all, then everything that is not Christ or aligned with His purposes is less than a priority. And that's what we want. Everybody in our circle to have that same priority, right? We're all marching to that celestial city. Amen? And Luke 14, 26, because here's the, here's the reckoning part of it. Those who come to me cannot be my disciples unless they love me more than they love father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and themselves as well. Amen? So this morning, it's about our priority. Where is it? When it comes to our those closest to us. Amen? Keith. Lisa's got a mic. He said, light supersedes darkness. Okay. We turn the lights off in here, it's pitch black. You flip on the light and it boom. Yep. Okay. Take that to our spiritual life. Our spiritual life 
We're supposed to bring the light to the world. Yep. That light will supersede that darkness. Now, it might not be instantly, but it will supersede the darkness. Yep. We just need to hold on to that. You look at Rome versus Wade. Prime example. Yep. We've had believers praying against that abortion. Guess what? The light superseded the darkness in that yep. abortion. And um, so our job is to take that light, present it. His job is to save them. Yep. Amen. Any other thoughts? Or... So again, next week, who should be interested? Those in greatest need. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for this time. God, we have, just in this group here, we have, there's a lot of people that are close, but they need you. So Lord, I just pray that, again, you would recommission us, God, to minister to those, those that are closest to us. In spite of, Lord God, maybe the struggle and, the, and, and what we get in return. Because, Lord, we're fighting the good fight. Lord, let our light so shine, right? We thank you for that, Lord. And we just invite your Holy Spirit to minister now to us in the, in the main service. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Copy, take it. Back to our head office.